of dry bones rattling. This is the praise making dead men walk again. Open the grave, I'm coming out. I'm gonna live, gonna live again. This is the sound of dry bones rattling. fire stirring something new you're not gonna run out of miracles anytime soon resurrection power runs in my face too I believe there's another miracle here in this world this is the sound of troubles This is the praise, make a dead man walk again. Hope in the grave, I'm coming out. I'm gonna live, gonna live again. This is the sound of dry bones rattling. This is 
that I need you so the feet of Jesus the greatness of mercy and love at the feet of Jesus and we cry holy, holy holy and we cry
sacrifice that you made when you sent your son to be the lamb that was slain for us, for our sins. We thank you that when he did it, when he did that, God, that you forgot him. You no longer, you don't look at us disappointed or heartbroken when we sin, God, but that it is it is forgiven. We love you so much, God. Lord, I pray his strength comes up here today, Father, that you would just give him the words. Open our hearts to hear, Lord. We love you so much, God. It's your name that I pray. Amen. Never met a match I couldn't handle. Get ready for a battle, cause you know. crafted amen? amen and uh, we've been talking for the last three weeks that we're crafted by God we are crafted right and righteous how's that sound we're, we're crafted right and righteous in the last three weeks we've been talking about that well we're gonna we're gonna shift our focus this morning we're gonna talk about being crafted free crafted free how about it does that sound pretty good amen, amen. we're crafted free free from the law of sin and death we are free in Christ Jesus and I don't, I don't think that we know how completely and utterly free we really are, but we are free from the law of sin and death. I can't think of a more appropriate time to talk about freedom than what we're going through right now in America. Amen? A lot of America is coming out of lockdown. Amen? We're coming out of, out of cell block C-19. I thought that was cute. Anyway, we're coming out. We're coming out of lockdown. We're, we're finding freedom, and I didn't think of a better time to talk about freedom than now. Uh, we're going to have some fun today. How about it? Uh, but unintentionally, 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 we are probably going to step on a few toes this morning. Um, so you might want to curl them up a little bit. But I think it's good that we step on some toes uh, every once and again because, you know, people think they're free. They think that they're completely free, but they're not, they're not really free, and God wants us perfectly and completely free. Amen? Amen. I was talking to my neighbor uh, this week. His name's Bobby. Bobby's 80 years old. I love the guy. He's a great man. He's salt, light of the earth. Uh, Bobby is, is an old cowboy from Matador, Texas. He's a good old, good old boy. He's been, he's been battling cancer and, and fighting cancer's butt for 19 years. Uh, but God is good to him, and... And, and you know what? Cancer is leaving. And I believe that. Cancer is leaving in the name of Jesus. Someone needs to hear that this morning. Cancer is leaving in the name of Jesus. And so Bobby, I was talking to Bobby this week. And as I'm talking to him, uh, well, firstly, Christy, she told me I needed to apologize to Bobby. She said that I needed to, to say I'm sorry. And so I told Bobby, I said, Bobby, I, I apologize to you this week. He goes, why? Why, why Trent? What's going on? And I said, well, because Christy says that when I'm in the office and I'm preaching parts of the sermon, sometimes the whole world can hear it, and that I had to come and apologize to you, and he goes, oh, Trent, don't worry about it, I, I've never heard it before, but now I'm going to go to the back of my yard and listen really close, <laughs> but he told me uh, about uh, his pastor friend in Matador, Texas, they just now got back to meeting in in-person services as a, as a flock, as a body of Christ, and he said a lot of their members were having a lot of trouble about it. Uh, you know, they're having to do the mask, and they're doing the gloves, and they have the rows of separation. And, and one of the church members came up to him and said, Who do you think you are? God. And the pastor looked at her, and he thought, He probably shouldn't have said it, but I would have. He, he looked at her and goes, Well, I'm the closest thing you'll ever get to God. <laughs> oh, oh, well, come on. Come on. <laughs> I told Bobby, Listen, you're not doing ministry right unless you're offending a few every now and again. Amen? Amen. It's a good thing that our culture at Connect is that we're ones that are not easily offended. So I'm believing that we're not going to be easily offended this morning. I didn't, silence is golden, okay? <laughs> so let's look at what the Apostle Paul talked about 
about being crafted right. And we're going to be in the book of Galatians if you'd like to turn there. I'm going to be reading from the Passion Translation. But we're going to start in Galatians chapter 5 verse 1. Let me be clear, Paul says. The anointed one, that's Jesus, has set us free. Not partially, partially, but completely and wonderfully free. Uh, okay, so, so Elise and Jeremy want freedom. Everybody else, I guess you like being in lock, lockdown. But, but in, isn't that awesome that Jesus has set us free, but, but not partially free. Not partially, but completely and wonderfully free. We must always cherish this truth and stubbornly refuse to go back into the bondage of our past. Now, what bondage specifically is, is Paul referring to here? Let's see, verse 2. Paul, I, Paul, tell you, if you think there is a benefit in circumcision and Jewish regulations, that was the law of Moses, the old covenant, then you're acting as though Jesus, the anointed one, is not enough. Listen, church, any time that we put ourselves or place ourselves back under rule, regulation, any type of law or works to be more pleasing to God or to be more accepted by God or to be received, to receive his favor more, we're acting as though what Jesus did on the cross wasn't enough to be loved by God, used, accepted, or able to receive his favor. Verse 3 goes on to say, I say it again emphatically. If you didn't hear it when I said it clearly, let me say it emphatically, Paul says. It, if you let yourselves be circumcised, you are obligated to fulfill every single one of the commandments and regulations of the law. Did you know that one of the regulations under the law was that you couldn't have a blended material of cloth? My shirt right now, I bet it says cotton polyester blend. And I, I, under the law, I would, I would be a sinner, like Trice coming in way late. <laughs> I told you I wasn't going to pick on you, but you're such easy material. <laughs> My goodness. Stop, stop it. Listen, we, we have fun here at Connect, but I, I want you to know that under the law, there was a lot of requirements, and we could not live up to the letter of the law. No one could. And Paul says, if you'd like to try, be my guest. Circumcision was the issue of the first century church. That's, that's one of their big issues that they really had to deal with in the first century. It was the difference between being under the law of Moses and the old covenant law and being under now the new covenant and being under the law of God and God's grace found in Jesus. The, the, the circumcision was a mark in the flesh of the Old Covenant. It was a mark of the Old Covenant. The New Covenant, we also have a mark on us, but it's not circumcision of the flesh, it's circumcision of the heart. And that we have a mark of the covenant in faith through water baptism. That's our outward display of our inner, inner faith. But here, the Jewish leaders who were saved, they were telling now all these Gentiles who were getting saved, they're saying, I, I know that you've been saved by grace. I know, I know that you've been saved by grace, but if you really want to be preferred in God's kingdom, if you really want to be holy in God's kingdom, then, then you're going to have to get yourself cut. You're going to have to, you're going to, have to obey the laws of, of the old covenant. It was a mark. You're going to have to be circumcised. Yeah, 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 you're free, they said, but not completely free. They were trying to mix law, church, works, unrighteous acts, if you will, in Jesus. They're trying to mix works and law with faith. With faith. Bottom line is Paul saying we don't let anyone bring you under any rule or regulation to be any more loved or any more accepted by God. Jesus already did that on the cross. And I think we need to understand this as a people of God today because he's not saying that we don't have rules, we don't have regulations, we don't have boundaries, we don't even have good works. Listen, we do have good works and they have their place, but not... If their place is to be any more preferred or accepted by God. That's not why we do what we do. And, and if you're taking notes, this is the key to today. This is the key to everything that we teach here at Connect. I can't do anything more. I can't do anything extra to be crafted any more right than how Jesus has already made me to be. 
I can't do anything more to what he has done and perfected me in the spirit. Now, the rest of me can catch up. And we can learn to grow and we can have an understanding. Our understanding can progress in who Christ has made us to be. And we can yearn for that, that day that we accomplish more and more maturity in the, in the faith. But everything I do is not to be more accepted or more loved or more beloved by God. He's already loved me in the beloved through Christ Jesus on the cross. Amen. I think you're getting it. I'm feeling good, guys. Verse 4. Verse 4. So Paul says, listen, I'm telling you, if you want to be circumcised, you can. But watch this. If you want to be made holy by fulfilling the obligations of the law, you're going to have to cut off more than just your flesh. You're going to have to cut yourselves off from Jesus, the anointed one, and have fallen away from the revelation of grace. Wow. Wow. Paul's saying, listen, if you want to go under the law, if you want to get under this regulation again, be my guest. But you're going to have to cut off more than just your flesh. You're going to have to cut yourself off from Jesus. You're on your own. Church, if by a show of hands, who wants to be on their own today with the law of Moses? Chantel would, would like to be on, under the law of Moses today on her own. Listen, no, we don't want to be on our own. Who do we want to be under? Jesus. Jesus is our covering. I'm going to show you something in a minute that might just bring you life today. It might be hard for us in this 21st century to, to be able to understand and make this leap, this connection what they were going through with, with the circumcision in that day and, and their struggle and what we're dealing with today and our struggle, right? It might be difficult to make that connection because I read verses like this and many of us, we hear those and we say, well, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not under the law anymore. I, I'm, not under, I'm not offering sacrifice. It's been a long time since I've sacrificed a goat or a lamb. I'm not, I'm not under any dietary restrictions. I eat bacon. Right? A lot of people might be thinking that right now. So, so what, what Trent just read, that doesn't apply to me. Right? Well, even though today, church, we're not following a Jewish calendar or we're not under the literal law of Moses, many of us, we're still under what I like to call self-imposed laws. Ooh. Maybe, maybe it's not self-imposed laws. Maybe it's laws or regulation we've allowed others to put on us. We've allowed others to put traditions of men on us or allowed others to put some kind of obligation in order to be more blessed or more received of God. And that way of thinking, that philosophy, church, what it does is it leads us into a place of greater bondage. It leads us back into the chains of shame and guilt and condemnation. And there are so many people of God who labor under that condemnation. Why? Because... They're under some kind of law of performance, something you have to do in order to be accepted by God. I'm here to tell you today that God has completely set us free. Amen. I'm just looking around. I can tell that, that we don't, we're not quite connecting yet, so I'm going to share some examples and some illustrations so it can hit us, hit us at home. Are you okay? This is where the toes get stepped on. Y'all good? Okay. Can I get a witness? That uh, in the old Mosaic law, they had obligations that were, that were requirements, but under Jesus, we don't have those same obligations. Okay, good. You can follow me there. Let's start with an easy one. How many know that God doesn't care about the clothes that you wear? Amen. You're like, I don't know. Is Trent tricking me? I don't know. Listen, God doesn't care about the clothes that you wear to be any more accepted or right by God or to be rejected by God. But how many churches and for how long have churches imposed what we wear in relation to be accepted by God? Imposed what we wear in a building to be considered holy before the Lord. Okay, this is hitting more people. I remember one of the first times that I ever preached behind a pulpit. I don't even have a pulpit. I like this pulpit because it doesn't look like this pulpit. Right? <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about. But... I remember the first time I was behind, preaching behind a pulpit. I showed up, and man, I thought I was dapper. Ooh, I was clean. I had my best jeans on. I had my awesome shoes on. I had a button-down shirt, and I had a suit jacket over it. Man, I thought I was pristine. But you know what? Me wearing jeans offended some people. How dare I, right? They came to me and said, you don't need to be wearing jeans behind the pulpit. What? As, as if my hand-me-down suit pants that were three sizes too big were more holy to God than my brand new jeans. 
right? Or my, or my, my 80s geometric tie. Y'all remember those, right? Man, I sacrificed those on the altar of forgetfulness to remember no more. I took those puppies to the Goodwill store, amen? Amen. They weren't more holy, but there was this imposed law. Regulation to be more accepted by God. You can't preach in jeans. Some churches, uh, they've put requirements on women, whether they should wear makeup or not. Should you wear makeup or should you not wear makeup? And that was the, the law, the regulation that was put on women. Anybody else ever had that, that law or regulation put on them before? You don't have to raise your hand. I see a few hands going up. Listen, I, I, don't, I don't think we understand. God's not hung up on what we wear on our body, and God's not hung up on what we wear on our face. Can I get a witness? God doesn't care if you... y'all and God's like whoo simmer down now simmer down okay you ready let's try this again God doesn't care about whether you wear makeup or don't wear makeup to be any more accepted or rejected by him amen uh (laughs) God ladies can I get a witness God doesn't care if you wear makeup or not now man does right I do I gotta preach to you every week Listen, listen, I, I don't care. I, you don't need to fall in it or put it on with a trowel because there's balance to everything, right? Y'all are looking at me like, Trent, move on right now, right now. But listen, God doesn't care if you wear makeup or not. Can I get a witness? Amen. Uh, this is going to make me sound really, really old. Uh, she's not in here today. She's helping with Kids Club, but uh, I'm going to sound like my dad. <sighs> I, don't, I don't care so much for holes in jeans. I knew y'all were going to condemn me for that. I don't, I don't care for holes in jeans, but my wife, Christy, she will buy jeans from the store that come pre-worn. Ariah's giving praise for that. Girl, I'm going to pray for you. So holes in jeans. that will, I'm like, Christy, just buy them new, and then you can put your own holes in a couple years. Hallelujah. There's some people that, that fill me there. My goodness, I don't care for holes in jeans, but can I get a witness? God's not offended if you have holes in your jeans and you come to church. God's... Oh, my goodness. See, we're revival is breaking out over here. God doesn't care if you wear your holes in your jeans. Now, the Bible does say that which you rip, you also have to sew. So there's that. So there's that. But how many know, I don't think God gives a rip about your ripped jeans. Amen. Uh, you know, in some churches, I wouldn't be allowed even in the door, let alone behind the pulpit, because I have a tattoo or two. See, some of you, I see it now, you're like, I knew he was a heathen. Hey, get your perf Ethel going right now. Now listen, I, God doesn't care about my tattoos. Don't, don't try to figure out where they are. Look up here. God doesn't care about my tattoos. Listen, uh, God doesn't care about that. 1 Corinthians 15 talks about women coming into the the, the sanctuary, into the house of worship. And it's dealing with what the old Mosaic law had. It had women coming into the sanctuary. They had to have a head covering over their head before they could worship the Lord when they came into the sanctuary. And Paul was dealing with this because there were women coming into the sanctuary, Gentiles, and they didn't have coverings over their head. Now, some of us, we might look at that and go, wow, that's outdated. That is way outdated. And some others might say, that is, that's sexist right there. But you know what? I, I look at that with a, a different heart and a different eye, and I go, wow, that's beautiful right there. That's beautiful. Because if you look at Ephesians chapter 4 and chapter 5, Paul tells us how to walk, walk in wisdom, walk in love, walk in understanding. But he also talks, talks us how, how, how to walk in marriage. Church, we need to be taught how to walk in marriage. Amen. Amen. We need to learn to love each other like Christ loved the church. But, but Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5 that, that the, the wife is to s- submit to the husband as, as, as unto the Lord, as the church submits unto the Lord. And he's saying this all, and if you really put it all in context, the way the women are supposed to have their heads covered when they worship God in the sanctuary is it was an outward symbol that their husband 
was their covering. That their husband was their covering. Well, Paul says this in Ephesians chapter 5, that, that when I'm speaking of Christ in the church, when I'm speaking of marriage, I'm really speaking of Christ in the church. What he was saying was, what he was saying was, listen, amen, amen, brother. You know what's the sign of a growing church? Crying, Crying babies. I love it. I love it. Thank you, Amanda. I love it. So listen, we, we've got this covering in the Old Testament that she couldn't come into the house of God without her head being covered. Because it was a, a show, an outward symbol that she was, her husband was her covering. But now Paul in the New Testament says your marriage is a symbol and it's a type of Christ and the church. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. How many of you know that we are the bride of Christ and he is our groom? And now when I enter the sanctuary in order to meet with Father God, I have a covering over my life. And that's through the blood of Jesus. He is my covering. Amen, church. I hope we get that this morning. So I look back on that Old Testament tradition of law, and I go, that was a type and a shadow of who we are now in Christ, and he is our covering. But can I get a witness that we don't, as a church or as a people of God, really need to have women with head coverings to come into the sanctuary now? Amen. We have our covering. His name is Jesus. So we don't need to cover our heads anymore. Well, Paul was dealing with that. He was dealing with, look, and she, she can come in without a covering. She's okay. She's not disgraced by God. She's, she's a blessing. Let her in. Paul was having to deal with that first century church. Paul made it very clear, church, we are not under those customs in the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. But can I get a witness? And this is awesome. I don't take it off. I'm so glad that you're in here today. But can I get a witness? Uh, even though we pretty much accept that women don't have to have head coverings in service anymore, what if a man walks in with a covering on their head in most churches? Keep it on. <laughs> Amen. Listen, if a man walks in with a hat in most churches, a great many of the body of Christ would be offended because oh, he's got his head covered in the sanctuary. It's a rule. It's an obligation that we've put ourselves under not to be displeasing to God. One of my worst experiences was when I was a child a couple years ago. Um, I, uh, I asked a friend to come to church with me. Love this kid, but he was a bad apple, and he needed Jesus. So I, I loved him to death, and I, we loved on him for, for months. We finally got this kid to church, and we walked in the door, and he had a baseball cap on. I didn't think anything of it, and we're walking down the hall, and we had a long hallway at this church, and, and, and the, the, one of the leaders of the church came in. One of the leaders of the church came in. He pulled my friend's hat right off of his head and stuck it in his chest and said, Boy, show some respect. You're in the house of God. To my knowledge, my friend has never entered another church since. Because we, we, not, we are not a member of that we anymore. But we has, had imposed this regulation that he couldn't be in the presence of God because his head was covered. Hmm. I say all this to say I don't have any personal problems if you take your hat off in the sanctuary. I think if you want to do that, that's great. If you take your hat off in prayer, I think that's wonderful. But God is not looking at your hat and thinking you're a disgrace. You know, Jonathan, I wish you would have worn it today. But sometimes Jonathan's up here on stage. And Jonathan's our worship pastor. And when he's on stage sometimes, sometimes what, what, he has something on his, on his head, right? It's a big old Aussie hat. Right, and I don't personally particularly like it. I think it's dumb. <laughs> He's not going to go wrestle an alligator after service. Crikey, there he is. <laughs> He's not going to do that, right? But listen, I don't think for one minute God is displeased with Jonathan for wearing a hat. I personally believe that God is in love with Jonathan, and he is in love with Jonathan's faith. That he is accepted and beloved because Jonathan has a faith in God and his son Jesus who died on the cross. Amen, John. I didn't really mean what I said about your hat. <laughs> you look really good in it, brother. And I'm just jealous because I look pathetic in hats. You ever see me in a hat? It's like my hat. I wore one yesterday. It's like my face is half the size it should be. It's supernaturally awful. I look dumb in hats. Jonathan, I'm sorry for hat shaming you. I love you, brother. <laughs> I love your faith, my friend. So the point is... I. Y'all are looking at me like, Trent, where is this going? There are points. Listen, the point is, 
All those examples, you might not like all of them or you might not like any of them, but all those examples are there to show us that maybe we've put ourselves under some rules or regulations, whether they're self-imposed or imposed by others. Maybe there's some even now today that we're under some rule or regulation try to be accepted or, or more loved by God. And we need to be released to that. Can I get a witness? We need to find freedom because Christ has come to set us free. Maybe we're condemning ourselves or maybe we're condemning others. But God is not holding that against us. And so that's why it's important for us to understand that we are not under any kind of rule to be any more loved or accepted by God. Because Jesus has already completely and perfectly set us free on the cross of Jesus, on the cross of Calvary. Amen? Okay, we need to understand that. When Jesus came to set me free, he came to set me free indeed. That was just my introduction, y'all okay? All right, so at the beginning of this, we read Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. But we want to kind of set this up to why Paul finally got to that place. So we're going to look at Galatians chapter 1, 2, 3, and 4. How many of you in here believe that I can get through four chapters in the Bible and make it? Oh, you of little faith. My goodness. Or you just know me that well. Let's, let's get through as many as we can, as quickly as we can. The first one, I just gave you a reference there. This is all we're looking at in Galatians chapter 1. It's Galatians chapter 1, verse 6. Through 10. This is when Paul opens with a scathing review, if you will, of these false teachers. And the reason that he calls them these false teachers is they were doing what we're talking about. They were trying to mix the law, works, with the grace of God and faith. And they were trying to commingle the two. And he forcefully rebukes anybody. And this is important because all of us in, in here are somebody. He said, if anybody, even if you do it to yourself, anybody who tries to preach anything other than the gospel of God's amazing grace through Jesus, should be cursed. that's That's a powerful rebuke. That's a scathing review. Church, we should not impose laws or regulations on others to be any more loved or accepted by God, but we should stop imposing the self things on us as well. On us as well. That was chapter one. See, chapter one's done, guys. Chapter two. Chapter two. So here in chapter 2, Paul is now rebuking Peter. I love Peter because he's just like me. He messes up all the time. And Paul's rebuking Peter, and he's rebuking Peter openly and publicly for his hypocrisy. Because Peter, he would go to the Gentiles, and he would love on the Gentiles. And he he would do what the Gentiles would do. He would eat what the Gentiles would eat. He would sit with them. He would love on them. He would be with the Gentiles. Many of them were coming to know the Lord. Through what Peter was doing. But one day James and all of James's friends came to the house and they were Jews. Well then Peter separated himself from the Gentiles and stayed over here with the Jews. Because he knew that the Jews, they believed in the grace of Jesus. But these Jews, they also obeyed the dietary customs of the law. They, they observed the Jewish traditions. And so now all of a sudden Peter's hanging out with the Jews and he's he's kind of shunning himself from the Gentiles saying that what the Jews are doing is good and what the Gentiles are doing, they're kind of a second rate, second class kind of Christian. And so Paul, he just rebukes Peter for this hypocrisy and he says this in in Galatians chapter 2 verse 16. Yet we know that a person is made right. There it is, crafted right. With God by what? Faith in Jesus Christ, not by obeying the law. And we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we might be made right with God because of our faith in Christ. Not because we've obeyed the law, for no one will ever be made right with God by obeying the law. But suppose we seek to be made right with God through faith in Christ, so we have faith in Jesus, And then we're found guilty because we've abandoned the law, the old covenant. Would that mean that Christ has led us into sin? Absolutely not. Rather, I am a sinner. So he's going back saying, I'm a sinner if I do this. I'm a sinner if I rebuild the old system. That's the old covenant. That's the law. If I rebuild the old system of the law that I already tore down in Jesus' name. For when I tried to keep the law, it condemned me. I want us to think about who's saying this. This is the Apostle Paul. This is, this is the Apostle Paul who wrote three-fourths of the New Testament. But before he was the Apostle Paul, remember who he was? Saul of Tarsus. 
He was a man after the covenant of, uh, of Moses. He had studied under one of the greatest teachers in all the, 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 the Torah, and that was Gamaliel. And he came up and he knew the law. He knew it intimately. He knew it to its uttermost. And Paul, who was Saul, he, he crossed every T. He dotted every I. He kept every jot and tittle of the law. But at the end of it, he saw what it made him to be. He was killing Christians. He was beating Christians. He hated this man, Jesus. Religion will mess you up, won't it? Amen. And he saw the danger of it here. And that's why he became, and I believe, the apostle of grace. And he said, I've tried to keep that thing. And what did it do? It condemned me. And then I condemned everyone else around me. He went on to say, it condemned me. Continuing in verse 19. It condemned me. So I died to the law. Yes! I stopped trying to meet all its requirements so that I might what? Live for God. This is huge. It's huge. It's huge. Huge. It's huge. Do you realize when people get caught up in religion or religious works and the chains of self-righteousness and the bondage of personal holiness, what happens is they're consumed, church. They're consumed with these self-righteous acts. Uh, keeping up with self and keeping all these, these little requirements and these little rules. They get so consumed with it that they, they stop loving God and stop serving God. They're so consumed with the self-righteous acts that they forget to serve the God and why they started in the first place. And when you stop serving God and stop loving God, then you stop loving people and serving people. Amen. As a result, you stop loving people and serving people anymore. But when you get a revelation, church... That God has crafted you free and completely free in Jesus. You don't have to be ashamed from that law anymore. All these requirements are gone. The bondage is gone. Now you're free by the grace of God to just love God and to serve God. And the result of that is you love people and serve people now. Amen. Amen. You can be a blessing to all those around you. Paul goes on to say in verse 20. My old self has been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not treat the grace of God as meaningless. Basically, Paul's saying if you're going under rule, obligation, or law anymore, putting yourself in that bondage, then you're treating the grace of God and what Jesus did on the cross as meaningless. That's huge. The King James Version says that you're frustrating the grace of God. And he goes on to say, For if keeping a law could make us right with God, then there would be no need for Christ to die. The fact that you and I, church, could not keep every jot and tittle of the law, it determined then that Jesus must come to die to set us free. To set us free, not keep us in bondage. By me keeping myself under law, I would be treating the grace of God as meaningless. I'm not just talking about the law of Moses. Y'all, you've got to understand that. I'm talking about self-imposed laws and religious laws that we've allowed, the traditions of men we've allowed to place ourselves under to be more accepted or more loved by God and less condemned. Years ago, I had an opportunity to preach. I'm just going to offend everyone today, okay? Years ago, I had an opportunity to preach uh, at a revival. It was a three-night revival in Hobbs, New Mexico. Anybody ever been to Hobbs, New Mexico? Yeah, yeah. Anybody else know any of the preachers who've been able to preach at hell and come back? I'm not talking about Hobbs. I'm talking about New Mexico. I'm kidding. I'm kidding, guys. Listen, y'all are, <laughs> y'all are not appreciating my humor today. It's, it's on fire. You're just not getting it. But <clears throat> I preached at Hobbs, New Mexico, and my wife, Christy, and I, we were there, and we walk in the door, and the chairman of the deacons comes up to meet us. And the cha- chairman of the deacons in this type of, of church, they're considered the boss of the church. And so we walk in, and the boss is coming up, and the boss looks at me, and he goes, well, is that what you're wearing, or are you going to change? Okay, so I let that one go, and I just kind of shook it from my head, and we were about to, no hi, no hello, no hola, just, is that what you're wearing, are you going to need to go change? Well, then he looks at Christy, my wife, and he says, ma'am, are, are you planning on bringing any special music today? <laughs> I, 
I looked at Christy, and she looked at me. We're just laughing. We look back, and he's not laughing. Apparently, in this type of church, the pastor's wife brings a special music and is, is expected to play the organ. And if she doesn't, she's, she's a second-rate pastor's wife. I'm going to tell you today, I got the best pastor's wife there is. Amen. Y'all tell her I said that. Give me some hope. Okay. <laughs> but they had put themselves under so much law and regulation and, and self-imposed rules to be more pleasing, accepted, or made holy by God. It really was frustrating the grace of God in their midst. So that night I got up to preach behind their pulpit. And I'm having a great time. I'm thinking, man, the fire of the Lord is here. But guess what? It was dead. It was lifeless. It was cold. And church, you know me. I say, I only preach as good as you respond, right? And so I just felt puny. I felt pathetic. And this was, this was way when I was young in the ministry. It's where I, I really, I was very sensitive to, to things and to people. The good news is God has hardened my heart over the years and hardened my heart Listen, God has hardened my heart to difficulties and not people. That's the good news. Is I, I'm not hardened to you. I love you. I'm hardened to my difficulties, and I'm not so sensitive anymore. But I was sensitive back then. So at the end of that first night, I still had two more nights of this, and I was like, God, help me. So I look at the boss, and I'm thinking, I'm just going to find out. He knows this culture. He knows this church better than anybody. And I come up to him, and I really wanted to help hurting people. It's like, look, I... I don't know what happened up there. I apologize, but could you tell me what I could do better? You know, what could I do to really just touch the lives and the hearts of these people over these next two nights? I, I just felt like we missed it tonight. And he looks at me, and he has advice. He doesn't even think about it. He goes, well, wear a full suit and shave your beard. <laughs> wear a full suit, because I was wearing pants again, and I was wearing jeans. They didn't have holes in them. And shave your beard. And back then, I had an awesome little goatee. It wasn't even this thing that I have on my face today. But you know the craziest thing about that was? Number one, I just want to say this. If you've ever been hurt by church or religion, that wasn't Jesus' doing. He loves you. He loves you the other most. And he loves his church. He looked at, he looked at uh, Peter and he told Peter, upon this rock, the revelation of who he was, he's going to build his church. So if you're a member of the body of Christ, you're a member of his church. And he loves you. And he'll never let you down. Amen? Amen. Woo! Okay. But the craziest thing about it was, y'all know those old churches, and they have, you know, the paneled walls, and at the back they have the baptistry, right? Right? And behind the baptistry, there was a big mural. And on this big mural, guess what they had a picture of? Jesus. And guess what? He, he was there in a, in a nightgown and a big old knotted, scraggly, dirty beard. Y'all are not appreciating this. It was a gross, nasty, blah, beard. I'm not putting the Lord's beard down. What I'm saying is that mine was, mine was clean and, and groomed. And they're worshiping this Jesus in a nightgown with a beard. And, and they think I can't be anointed by God because I'm not wearing a suit and I don't have a clean shaven face. You see? And church, I know that all, us here, we're like, we're not that. But how many of us can be honest with ourselves and go, what rules, what requirements, what things have we put ourselves under to be more accepted, more loved by God? What things can we be released of? Because Jesus did come to set us free and utterly free. I got to find my notes because that was a long story. I just wonder how many religious things we put ourselves under that we just need to be set free from. What things have we allowed us to condemn ourselves for or allowed others to condemn us? Uh, we got to understand that, church, can I get a witness that we are the beloved? We are the beloved. We, we are not under any kind of performance-based works to be any more loved or any more accepted by God. We've been crafted free. We've made the very righteousness of God, not by works, not by haircuts, not by the clothes we wear, not even by the things that we do, the righteous or, or unrighteous acts, the dietary laws. We've been made the very righteousness of God by His amazing grace through the blood of Jesus and our simple childlike faith. Amen. Can we give God praise for that? Amen. 
Okay, I want you to say it with me. If Jesus came to set us free, who the Son makes free is free indeed. Do you believe that? Let's give God praise this morning. Amen. Amen.